Welcome. I'm Glenn Tiffert, a research fellow at the Hoover Institution, where along with Larry Diamond, I co-lead the project on China's global sharp power. Last month, on November 11th to be precise, the Chinese Communist Party concluded the sixth plenum of its 19th Party Congress with the unanimous adoption of a resolution of the CCP Central Committee on the major achievements and historical experience of the party's centuries of struggle. Now that title is a mouthful, and many observers are therefore taken to calling it the third resolution on party history as a kind of shorthand. And as the name implies, there have been two other such resolutions, the first in 1945, which cemented Mao's dominance of the party, and the second in 1981, which did something similar for Deng Xiaoping, though the process was longer. In view of those precedents, the latest resolution could mark a major inflection point for Xi Jinping in China. The adoption of the latest resolution was not a surprise. The party had telegraphed its intentions for months, and as the plenum approached, a crescendo of chatter and official party propaganda outlets hinted at the content. Nevertheless, the actual text was not revealed to the public until November 16th, and we can be quite certain that every one of the resolution's 27,000 words in the English translation, at least, was scrutinized carefully. We're told, for example, that there were over 500 revisions to the draft. To help us unpack what this plenum might mean for China, the US and the world, we have a dream team of experts assembled today. Professor Timothy Cheek of the University of British Columbia in Canada is one of the world's leading intellectual historians of modern China and particularly of the CCP. The most recent of his many books is the Chinese Communist Party, A Century in 10 Lives which was published this year by Cambridge University Press. Professor Joseph Fusmith is a political scientist at Boston University and one of the most astute observers of China's contemporary elite politics. His most recent book is Rethinking Chinese Politics, which was also published this year by Cambridge. I'm sensing a package deal here. And finally, Alice Miller, who is a historian of China and a Hoover Research Fellow. Alice had a very distinguished career as one of the top analysts of China in the US government before coming to Hoover, where she edited the China Leadership Monitor from 2001 to 2018. I kid you not, if our panelists were a band, we'd call them a supergroup. So the format will be a roundtable discussion. I may start by directing a question to one of our panelists, but I encourage the others to join in at any time to enrich the conversation. We'll reserve the final 15 minutes for audience Q&A, so please submit your questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screens. We have a diverse audience, so let's not assume so much background at the, at the beginning, and we'll start by laying some basic foundation. Then we can quickly turn to some more advanced material. Joe, I wonder if you can give us a basic civics lesson here. What is a party plenum? Who attends them? What business do they transact? And why is this one? Why was this one so anticipated and laden with significance? Well, Glenn, thanks for asking. Uh, I think there are two basic uh, uh, party meetings that are really important. Uh, one is Congress, which meets every five years. Um, there are something like 3,000 or more delegates to a Congress, and its job is to elect a central committee and other um, bodies. Uh, a plenum is when that central committee meets uh, as in plenary session, the whole body of the uh, central committee gets together, uh, depending on the year, twice a year or once a year. Um, this one was anticipated because, uh, as you said, uh, there have been only two other uh, history resolutions in the party's history, uh, one in 1945, one in 1981. And so we were all curious to see how this was going to evaluate um, the past and what it might portend for the future. Excellent. Thank you. Tim, in his formal explanation of the resolution, she said, our party has always attached great importance to reviewing its historical experience. Why? Why go to all the trouble of drafting the 70 page document and sweating over every word? It's a bit of a bizarre exercise for someone who doesn't understand Leninist party systems. And you know, in August, the Politburo said that one of the rationales for the resolution was having a correct perspective on CCP history. What do they mean by a correct perspective? Should we all take comfort that the CCP shares our commitment to doing good history? 
And well, what are they hoping to achieve? What are the stakes here? Well, Comrade Tiffert, you asked the correct question. <laughs> and, and that is history is science. And uh, uh, Central Committee resolutions are the peer reviewed scientific conclusions of the science of political order as determined by the best minds who are of course, senior party people. And it's the equivalent and they set down what is the main task and what is, the, what is to be done. And these are the rules of the road for the foreseeable future. It's, this, it's like, it's just as real for those who believe in the party ideology. It's just as real as what's the latest theory of physics as certified by the Nobel Prize. And what, we, what I would like to discuss with my colleagues here is I tend to call historical resolutions um, constitutional revisions using the British unwritten constitution kind of idea of how you ought to do things. I'm very mindful that every uh, party Congress uh, sets that as well. And so even in the current historical resolution, as you marched through the uh, uh, leaders of the party and the major party conferences with maybe skipping 1982 um, for, you know, for reasons that, you know, we won't go into uh, the um, each time there's that phrase, the main task was blah, 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 blah. And th that means when you get main task, that's the political line. So the reason we're all paying attention to this is end of debate. You, the, the, the revisions have done now, this, this is the document that I think for the next 10 years going forward sets what is legal and illegal, legitimate and illegitimate ways to talk, talk about the history of the people who are running your life if you live in China. Would anyone like to add to that? If that didn't go to Alice, nothing will. <laughs> no, I agree with you entirely, uh, Tim. Um, Marxism-Leninism is, of course, the science of human affairs. Historical materialism is the other branch of dialectical materialism. And Marx, Engels, Lenin, Stalin, Mao have developed uh, the uh, skills to interpret the trends in history according to Marxist-Leninist laws and thereby design uh, the path forward uh, for the party and for, in this case, the Chinese people. So I agree with you entirely. Right. And they have the key to understanding. And so that gives them the right to rule. Uh, That's right. Right. So, Alice, um, can you explain the life cycle of one of these resolutions? You know, what generally precedes them? How are they drafted? Who are they meant for? And once they're issued, what happens? Well, um, this one uh, was the process was the product of about six months or seven months of, of gestation, although it was probably on the books um, right after the first plenum of the 19th Central Committee uh, back in uh, back in 2017. Uh, it's been the general rule uh, that the first plenum after a party Congress sets the agenda for the forthcoming plenums uh, of the Central Committee. And so this has been looming uh, for uh, four years now. Uh, uh, it was obvious simply because um, it would be the 100th anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party, and therefore some sort of statement or evaluation of the party's past would be on the books. In um, February uh, this year, uh, the party kicked off a party-wide study campaign uh, on, uh, to, to study party history. And for that purpose, uh, they issued a brand new short history of the Chinese Communist Party. I hope everybody has it on their bedside table for uh, reflection and digestion late at night, uh, as I do. Uh, it was accompanied by a volume of uh, some, I think, 60 excerpts or speeches by Xi Jinping on aspects of history, and then uh, another volume of questions and answers, how to interpret issues in party history. They appointed a leading small group to guide the campaign, and uh, the month after that, in uh, March, uh, they set up a drafting group under the direction of Xi Jinping, assisted by Wang, Hu, Wang Funing, who's the ideology guy uh, in the current leadership, uh, and also by Zhao Liji. I've never been able to figure out why him. He's the head of the Discipline Inspection Commission. But anyway, the three-ban uh, group presided over the drafting of the resolution. Uh, it went through several drafts. I think you mentioned over 500 revisions. It was reviewed 
um, uh, at different levels of the party. And then specifically, uh, it was noted in Xi Jinping's explanation to, to the plenum uh, that it was sent in particular uh, to retired senior party leaders, uh, whom I presume means Hu Jintao, Jiang Zemin, uh, Wen Jiabao, and, and the rest. Finally, it was um, uh, approved by the Politburo and forwarded to the plenum for consideration. So that is a typical drafting process, a little shorter, I believe, than the 1981 resolution, which uh, took um, more than a year uh, to, to uh, compile. Uh, so it goes through a process of um, uh, in soliciting opinions uh, and then revisions uh, to try to create a consensus or at least impose a consensus on what this resolution is going to say. So by the time it gets to the plenum, it's a it's a fixed text, and everybody everybody has seen it many times, and um, so uh, but they go through the motions of reading it out and then approving it unanimously. At that point, it's the page proofs. That's right. right. That's right. right. So there there are two bookends to these things very often, and I wonder if you could comment, any of you, um, based on your understanding of how these have happened in the past, very often these resolutions are accompanied um, or preceded by a rectification campaign. Uh, certainly the first one was, and um, I think there's a strong argument for this one also, um, being preceded by a rectification campaign. And so what is that about? And then at the tail end, of course, when a document such as this is issued, I think, as Tim said, this sets the general line um, that has to be disseminated. And so there's a study campaign that begins. And how does that percolate through um, the political system? And, and who, how is it organized? And, and who is forced to sit through these grueling things? Tim, why don't you start with that one? Oh, well, you know, you know me, I love ideology and I, propaganda. Then, you know, since, uh, since April of 1942, propaganda has been for internal party use and direction. And so part of the reason that this, is, this historical resolution is so important is that it is the rules of the road, but particularly for those 90 million party cadres, starting with them and then also and uh, bothersome intellectuals who should avoid historical nihilism and uh, uh, people in the general public who should avoid landmines. But you're absolutely right. Remember, there has been, and as Alice mentioned, the, the party history study campaign has already been going, you know, year, year and a half, and also the rectification, particularly in the um, political legal uh, bureau, uh, Chiton, has been going uh, pretty serious um, rectification drives there. What I'm interested in there is these more surgical rectifications rather than a whole of whole of nation rectification. Uh, I we can um, you know we can always go to my Liu Xiaoqi thesis whenever you're ready. Uh, the uh, um, you know that's that style, the work team approach to um, uh, modifying the party. But you're absolutely right. The document itself is only a template. It's the new software. The, you know, I, I see this whole resolution as a software update. They've got the hardware. They've got, a, they've got a good economy. They've got a scary military. They've got an effective, pretty effective um, security, domestic security force. But they got some real problems of, you know, sort of Leninist sclerosis. And so this is their answer, is to upgrade the software. Will it work? They will spend time upgrading everybody's software in here, in your brain, uh, through a, a continued study campaign. I'd be interested, Joe, uh, what, what kind of institutions are they going to use to do this? Good question. Um, at the local level, I think that they will simply use party schools. Uh, I suspect that a good number of uh, local officials are probably right now at uh, maybe a week or 10 day session at the local party school, getting an authoritative readout of this uh, document. Um, they will memorize certain formulae in this document. Uh, and uh, judging by the content of this and some other documents that have come out, uh, so-called Dang Xing, the, uh, the party spirit, uh, shall we call it, uh, is gonna be really emphasized. Uh, I think one thing that we're gonna get into is how little history is in the history resolution and how much of how do you run a Leninist party in a post-Leninist time is what's in here. And Xi Jinping is going back and saying, uh, well, it starts off by saying, uh, the problem is the law of ideals and convictions. 
Those were the words he used back in Guangdong right after he took office. And I was really struck by his almost uh, delightful faith that you could force people to have ideals and convictions that they will uphold these sorts of ideals, principles, and the whole history of the party shows that that is highly unlikely. Joe, Joe, you're suffering from historical nihilism. I can just it's smell it. You have no faith in the power of will. Well, Joe, I think that answers why the CCDI was involved in sharing the, the drafting of this. <laughs> I'm afraid you're right. But the, part, the resolution is contradictory. It says, study party history. I've done that. It's not a very glorious history. Uh, no. And yet it insists that it is. Um, Joe, this gets to a point that I want to I want to get from all of us, which is we've all noted that the first two party history resolutions were talking about twenty problems. Yeah. There are no problems named in this one. It's all what is it? It's a Zhongchang, right? The the uh, the the great achievements. What's up? Except it does say corruption is yeah, uh, the yeah. number one lessons, yeah. problem for the survival of the party. Right, and so mm -hmm. even though it's says that it had a great victory, probably meaning uh, Zhou Yangtang and so forth. Uh, it suggests that this is a continuing problem. And it does suggest that in the last 20 years, people have taken their eyes off the ball, right? Um, and yeah, the, that's no, I, the, reading through between the lines there, there's pretty strong implicit criticism of the Jiang and Hu years. But, but let me actually put some structure around this, this discussion because we're about to get into the content of the resolution. And that is, um, I'll, I'll start with Tim and, and invite the others of you to join in. What is, what is in fact different or similar about this resolution as compared to the previous two? Um, you know, there was a lot of anticipation and head scratching that the larger political context behind this resolution is so different than the others. You know, in 1945, Mao was heading off, you know, a, a challenger in a sense um, uh, within the party and, and he had to declare his, his, his unchallenged authority. Um, Deng Xiaoping similarly was having to put the Cultural Revolution behind them and deal with the Gang of Four trial. These are giant things. Um, Xi Jinping is not in that same position. So apart from the 100th anniversary of the party, what, what is the precipitating event here? Um, so why is, how is this resolution similar or different from the other two to your minds, Tim, and then the others, please? The, well, you, you hit the big context one, uh, the, to which to what you said, I would add that in 1945 and 1981, Mao and Deng had living competitors in the Central Committee and who had to be um, convinced to take it, to swallow it. How he got Wang Ming to, uh, Mao got Wang Ming to, you know, take the, take the rap, you know, is amazing. Um, so it, it's, uh, you know, uh, but I don't see, and I'm, I, I defer to my colleagues who know the Central Committee better than I do, I don't see active uh, viable alternatives to Xi or competitors. Uh, Zhou Yongkang, you know, Bo Xilai, others have, have been brought down. Um, and so therefore, that's a very different environment. So the enemy isn't bringing party unity in the face of internal dissent. I think he sees the uh, attack on party unity to be external. And so this is, a, this is a, I see this as a rallying cry to rally around the flag um, uh, to uh, um, basically support the status quo. I mean, it's the most unrevolutionary Communist Party resolution I've seen. But I, Alice, I know you have some thoughts about the amount of history in the historical resolution. Yeah, well, um, I guess I differ slightly. I think there is parallel between the three resolutions in the sense that each of them served a point of trying to rally support behind the leadership for a forthcoming mission or goal. Um, uh, in the case of, of uh, 1945, it was um, at the end of the Sino-Japanese War uh, and then the effort to liberate China and create a socialist China in 1981. It was overcoming uh, just the Maoist uh, ideas from the Cultural Revolution period, but also pushing reform ahead. And in this case, uh, it's um, 
uh, galvanizing support for the party's agenda as set down under Xi Jinping, the so-called policies associated with the new era of, of socialism with Chinese characteristics. Now, it, I think there is a certain amount of criticism of the past. I think you or somebody alluded to this uh, that um, does go directly uh, to uh, the, the Hu Jintao and Jiang Zemin periods without naming them directly. And if you work through the various aspects of the resolution and pull out these critical aspects, it's a rather daunting list of problems. Uh, it includes, for example, lack of compliance with central party uh, decisions, collapse of party decision, uh, collapse of party discipline, uh, institutional and structural problems with the economy, proliferation of vested interests, especially after the 08-09 financial crisis, pressures for systemic political change, um, um, uh, corruption of the legal system, uh, deviant ideological and intellectual trends, and as, as I said earlier, most alarmingly, failure in party leadership over the army. Uh, and so uh, this is a fairly significant set of problems, um, and uh, it is they are put forward uh, to rationalize and justify the various approaches in concept and policy that Xi Jinping's leadership has put forward. Uh, and so Xi Jinping stressed this, I think, in his uh, explanation of the uh, uh, resolution uh, to the plenum by saying that the object of all three resolutions was to galvanize consensus within the party. It does raise the rather interesting question uh, of, uh, Joe often uh, argues, I think, helpful, helpfully that party discourse is a conversation. And so in the face of assertions of one kind or another, it's always useful to ask, well, who is it arguing against? Uh, and that is to say, I agree with you that it's not easy to identify elements in the Central Committee, um, although they may be there. It's always hard to, to find them. Um, uh, but uh, one alternative might be uh, the uh, assertion in the minds of some members of the Central Committee and lower down uh, that she has in fact mismanaged aspects of policies and challenges facing the party and therefore uh, may uh, um, uh, should not continue in power. Um, also, it could be um, a galvanized effort to try to get at the continuing problem uh, that the Xi leadership has stressed, and that is to say, lack of compliance behind the centralized authority of the power in its decisions. Uh, and so it's aimed at uh, the vested interests and so forth that have confounded the party and uh, the party center in carrying out its policies. So I think there is a consistency here, in at least trying to give a framework uh, for marching forward. Um, and it's useful to see, ask what the uh, resistance uh, to that might be. Joe, do you have any thoughts then on, on what the, the silent voices behind the text might be? And, yes. um, and then I want to also pull on, on a thread that Alice raised, and that is party control of the army. Uh, Xi Jinping moved very quickly to establish that, you know, quite in contrast with his immediate predecessors. And uh, I, I, I'm curious about your reflections on, on his choices there uh, and how much he's associated himself with the army. Well, I think that's all true. Um, let me go to Alice's point about people disagreeing. Uh, I think that there is substantial um, amount of, let's say, uh, well, just, I mean, he's offended a lot of people. Let's start there. Uh, you know, when you go after um, the military hierarchy, when you go after the party hierarchy, uh, Zhou Yang Kang, Bo Xilai, are not weak people. Uh, there are a lot of people who maybe disagreed with them, but think that Xi Jinping has gone very far. Um, you know, there are, I, I don't know how many uh, we're up to now that have been. Uh, punished in one way or another by the party, uh, but it's we're into the at least hundred thousands of people that have been punished in one way or another. And this is at the top of the party system, albeit at different levels. Uh, and so I have to assume that there are a lot of people that disagree, um, in, including their families. So these are a very articulate group of people with many connections throughout the party. 
uh, and it's not easy to take on that whole group. Uh, and he's been um, either foolhardy or courageous to try to do that. Uh, so I think a lot of people have dis disagreed. A lot of people would look at say the growth rate of China and say, uh, Xi Jinping has scared the bejeebers out of cadres to the point that they're not willing to do anything and therefore the economy has slowed down. Uh, I suspect there are a lot of people that look at the Sino-US relationship and say, do we really need it to be this tense? Uh, has this guy created problems that we didn't need to deal with? Uh, and I think that's a very significant and important question. Uh, you mentioned the military and uh, you know, I, I have argued um, that it took Jiang Zemin a significant period of time to really control the military. In fact, uh, he put Xu Caihuo and Guo Buxiong in as vice chairmen of the military at the 16th Party Congress as he was stepping down as general secretary. So he had this, um, what, um, arm's length control of the military. And, you know, Xu Caihuo, from the time he was appointed to um, the general political department to the time he stepped down, uh, had vetted something like 83 people who were being promoted to the level of general, the, the, you know, the top of the military. And so for Xi Jinping, he not only wanted to get rid of Xu Caihuo, but all of those 83 people and probably the people that they had promoted. Uh, and this probably points to Xi's concern with what he calls Tuan Tuan Ho, the uh, group, you know, factionalism. And what's he done but put his own people in office? Uh, I think that one of the, I, I could imagine a lot of cadres in China sitting around the uh, cafeteria lunch and complaining about how many people, friends that Xi Jinping has promoted directly. Uh, you know, you complain about factions, but what are you doing? You're creating your own faction. Uh, here we have two people on the Politburo who never even served on the Central Committee before. Um, that's just um, that's just against organizational norms. Uh, so I think that there is a lot of uh, discontent in that sense. And one of the things that I th was struck by in the um, resolution was that he says, we got to fight this idea from the West of constitutionalism, uh, Western constitutionalism, or the idea that parties should alternate in power. So apparently those ideas are still out there, uh, even in the Central Committee, uh, though nobody is going to voice those <laughs> concerns. Joe, the way, you, the way you put it puts me in mind that we really are back to the future. We're also old and gray you not quite so much, uh, that, you know, you were doing work in the 70s and 80s, and lo and behold, how did we read the People's Daily then? Which is when they declared a victory over corruption in Hunan, it meant that they've noticed there's corruption in Hunan, and they're, they're starting to work on it. So are we back to reading this in the old uh, Remy Nurbao reading style of um, anything declared as a victory is an admission of a problem? <laughs> I'm afraid that that's uh, part of the uh, study of China. I, I really would prefer not to read Renmin Rabao every day. <laughs> <laughs> they have an app for that now. Um, I, was, uh, I was wondering then, um, let's turn to the content for a second without getting too much in the weeds. Um, I wonder, um, Alice, you know, in reading through the resolution, is there anything that jumped out at you that surprised you? in the resolution. I mean, we've, we've articulated that, that this is a mobilizational document that sets the general line and, and the goals you know, that, that the nation and particularly the party are going to mobilize around to try to achieve. Um, but, um, but with all the anticipation that we brought to, to when this document would drop, um, what is in there that, that you didn't expect to see and what isn't there? Well, I think the thing that leapt out to me when I first read, uh, first read the resolution was the statement that Xi Jinping is the principal founder of Xi Jinping, the Xi Jinping thought for the new era of socialism and Chinese characteristics. I've never been able to, to short, to abbreviate that mouthful. 
Um, I had not seen that um, uh, description of Xi Jinping's role before. And I know previously uh, in reading the three volumes of his collected speeches on governance, uh, the preface to those has suggested uniformly uh, that Xi Jinping thought for the new era with socialism and Chinese characteristics is the crystallization of the collective uh, leadership. And so this seemed a step beyond that. And so I was surprised by that. And I'm not entirely sure uh, what I want to make of it. Uh, as I said earlier, I was also uh, impressed uh, by the scale of comments of problems uh, that the Xi Jinping has tried to address. It's notable to me that they didn't name the previous leaders, which seems to me uh, uh, an effort to legitimate and justify, rationalize the kinds of policies that Xi Jinping has been pushing. Um, and so those are the two things that, that sort of leapt out at me. Um, uh, in particular. Joe, Tim, in succession, please. Well, I, I think we all anticipated more history in a history resolution. Uh, oh, details. I, no, I didn't. I didn't. I, oh, they, said okay. I, they said explicitly they were not going to revise the 45 and 81 resolutions. No, but, uh, I, and if, you know, earlier in the Xi Jinping era, uh -huh. he had this Liang Sanshunian, right? Yeah. The, uh, mm -hmm. And said, Gee, the Deng Xiaoping period is really a continuation of the Mao Zedong period. He laid the foundation. And so you can't set these two things against each other. I guess I expected to have a uh, authoritative statement of that position. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as you're, you're perfectly right that there are these um, implicit criticisms of um, the previous leaders, I perhaps expected a more direct criticism that certain par aspects of reform have in, uh, led to um, inequalities of income and so forth. Because I, I think there's a lot in Xi Jinping that flat out disagrees with Deng Xiaoping. I know they're living in different eras, but uh, you know, he really is the anti-Deng. Yeah. And I want to come back to that, Joe, in just a minute. Yeah, but okay. I'll riff, I'll riff on that, which is, I I I take in my sort of public talks talk about Xi Jinping counter reformation, and yes. the Protestant Reformation was the uh, 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 seek truth from facts and let there be markets. And I agree with Joe. I think uh, we can interpret why, but I think we agree that it is so that Xi Jinping is busily reversing a number of those things, and you know. It's like it suggests that the party's uh, acceptance of market and openness and even intellectual pluralism was was tactical rather than substantive. It was until China was strong enough that it didn't have to do it anymore. And that's an interpretive line that can make sense of the information that we have before us. And this is, you know, on one hand, it's like we don't have to, to kowtow to the foreigners anymore. We, we are done. The other side is what Alice has warned us is there's a frightening list of problems since it, it, a bit this 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 litany of successes. It's like one more success like that. What is it? Pompey's victory. You know, one more like that and you're toast. You know, the, the uh, it, it's uh, um, uh, it, it, there's the there's the anxiety. So it's this bravado and anxiety, which, of course, we've seen in their foreign affairs. You know, it seems to me that that litany of problems um, serves several purposes. You know, number one, it, it says, yes, you did leave me a mess, but I'm here to clean it up. Uh, and so it justifies the last 10 years. But it also is a strong argument for five more, right? It's, and so it seems to me that, that perhaps he's setting the stage for that. Um, but beyond that, it... You know, going back to to the criticism, the implicit criticism of of Hu and Jiang, and and also this, you know, the anti Dung aspect mm -hmm. of his agenda, there really seems to be a reordering of the pantheon going on here. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, um, if you look at the nomenclature, for example, you know, at the moment, um, I think Alice was spot on with the point uh, about you know that mouthful of Xi Jinping thought for socialism, you know, with Chinese characteristics in the new era, where that's a really unwieldy phrasing right now, but it's got the thought word, the sixian in there. 
And we may get to a point not very long from now where they just drop all the other stuff and we're left with the eponymous, you know, Sixiang. And there's only one other person who has that, right? That's Mao. Mm -hmm. You know, Deng is just has Li Lun. Mm -hmm. um, and right, and the others, well, forget it. They just have Guan. You know, it's that, that we don't even talk about that, right? So, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, it seems to me that there's a subtle step by step reordering of the pantheon going on here. I'm, I'm just curious like, your reactions to, to that statement. Well, I, I'll jump in here and be a little bit of a sound a little bit of a dissonant note. I was looking for a stronger suggestion in the resolution uh, that she is not only the principal founder of Xi Jinping thought for the new era of socialism, Chinese characteristics, but he should continue to be. And I searched the resolution, could not find that. Instead, uh, I would invite a shift of perspective. Instead of reading the resolution in the context where everybody seems to uh, expect that she will continue as pow in power as the general secretary, turn that around and read the resolution from the perspective of uh, Xi Jinping about to retire. Now, I don't see too much difference in the resolution. You could read it either as a mandate for him continuing, but also as a statement or a declaration of his legacy moving forward. I've set the ground rules and now you've got to carry it forward. Um, and I know yesterday, I think it was yesterday, there was an article in People's Daily by the head of propaganda, Chen Xi, on training up successors. Uh, and so um, I worry a little bit about reading too much in the resolution uh, with regard to uh, Xi Jinping's future. Now, I am quite ready to agree. I expect Xi Jinping to continue, although I'm agnostic about what form that will take. Uh, and I can imagine scenarios other than the one that he just continues for a third term as the party's general secretary uh, than, um, uh, than that one. Uh, and so uh, I'm really complaining here about the use of evidence, uh, uh, the use of the resolution. And we need to be careful here in exaggerating the import in context that may be shaky. I, Joe, it looks like you want to hop in. I, I hate to agree with Alice. <laughs> Oh, uh, not again. <laughs> but, you know, there was this fascinating article, um, September, I think, 1919 in Chosher that says one of the marks of a, what, uh, a mature leadership or something like that is the regular alternation of people in office. Yep. And I've had that in the back of my mind for years, um, what's going on? Did somehow that slip through uh, an authoritative journal like, uh, like Chosher? And it was highlighted, that sentence was highlighted on the front page of Renman Rabao. Was this an attack on comrade Xi Jinping or was it a statement of some principle that he would like to uh, articulate? Uh, you know, what does Xi Jinping thought on rule of law actually mean? Does it mean simply, I'm going to use laws that I make up to bully other people? Um, I, I'm tempted to go with that. Uh, <laughs> but it may also be something uh, about that he might step down to the second line or something of that nature. As, Joe, I'm going to uh, jump. Joe, I'm going to jump in because you're 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 both so right. Do you see? I see a tension in the language of the historical resolution that I want to ask, and that is, um, we all know it's about you know praising Xi Jinping and having his name in the resolution and uh, uh, downplaying everyone else. And yet, when I look at the syntax of the sentences, it is the Central Committee has done X. Yes. The Central Committee has done Y, and you know. You know me, I'm Mr. Liu Xiaoqi. I'm going like, yeah, that's our institutional Leninism. And yep. you, Joe, that's your gospel, right? You know, yeah, this is yeah. what Leninism does. So if you, there's one way to read the historical resolution to say, actually, it's reaffirming, the, as, as Alice mentioned, the crystallization of the collective thought, et cetera, et cetera. Yet on the other hand, Xi Jinping is paramount. So what do you make of this sort of rhetorical contradiction or tension or does not seem to be one to you? Tim, you're anticipating my questions. This is great. 
Well, there's also the phrase in the resolution about putting power in a cage, uh, which was an interesting one to uh, repeat uh, in this. I know that comes from an earlier period of the administration, but uh, you know, you kind of read this and you say, now what, what cage is Xi Jinping's power in? Uh, it's just another one of those contradictions in this uh, document uh, that we will be pondering for the next year until the answer is revealed at the 20th Party Congress. I mean, it seems to me that there's a little bit in there for everyone, right? There is Xi Jinping as the founder, right? That, that, is, that is different. But then there is also Xi Jinping. And this is what struck me most um, for those who are expecting him to be more front and center. He's the vessel of the party yeah. uh, here, right? And that's just, that's classic. And, and they say that over and over again, right? Um, the party needs a leader and I just happen to be it. But, you know, this is about the party. Um, and, you know, that is classical Leninism, but is that just maybe tactical? Is that him playing to that, that pushback in the party that if he moves too quickly, uh, then, you know, maybe, or, or is it just step-by-step -step methodical? So, you know, in the next cycle, he, he moves the needle a little further because if you look at the last nine years, we've come a long way, right? Well, you know, you, you go back to those uh, other two history resolutions and uh, they both set up a uh, leadership for at least the next 10 years. Uh, so in that sense, I really don't expect Xi Jinping to go anywhere. Uh, it's possible that they could try to divide the leadership into two lines. Uh, historically, that doesn't seem to have worked out too well. Yeah. Uh, and so I'm not ex expecting that to happen. Um, but I, I, I guess I think history resolutions are intended to solidify a leadership for at least the next decade. Let me put something provocative out there. Um, I want to hear your reactions because I'm hearing this from people that I speak to, too, who, um, whose opinions I, I take seriously, including some from China. Uh, you have a, an increasingly hard authoritarian regime a burgeoning personality cult around a leader with a singular vision, a kind of macho preoccupation with strength and vigor and a concomitant disdain for pluralism and weakness. You have an essentializing neo-traditionalist exaltation of culture and a glorious imperial past, revanchism, stoking of nationalism, social conservatism, corporatist control of leading private firms, hardening racialism, and even in a Chinese context, at least a nod towards natalism in light of the demographic crisis they're facing. I feel like we've seen this movie before. Is, is China slipping towards fascism? I was gonna say, as you made that list, I said, now, now Glenn, you know, don't be so positive. You know, tell me what you're doing. <laughs> there are a lot of problems according to the resolution. <laughs> the, uh, that's a perfectly legitimate uh, line of um, uh, 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 litany of problems and challenges. And I think the first thing I do as a historian is I just try to line it up in context. I don't have the, I don't have the answer. My, uh, I'm gonna to defer in a moment to my specialists in the Game of Thrones study. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, but you know, it's also the most powerful communist party on the planet. It's also a successful economy. It's also, uh, you know, uh, shown uh, global leadership at times that that um, the Western powers have uh, uh, abandoned. Um, and it also has broad based public support. If we're to believe these various uh, um, opinion polls that you know the Harvard group and others uh, seem to think have some reality to them. So not, what, what I'm suggesting is we have to look at those challenges along with their strengths. They have the ability and the state capacity to do a lot. And it's clear that Xi Jinping is not afraid and the Central Discipline Inspection Commission is not afraid to as assert itself. So I see those things as a, in a complicated uh, mishmash. I guess I would point to the list that you gave us a moment ago and suggest that a lot of that is defensive precisely because of this long list that uh, Alice gave us of the problems that they're facing. Uh, and you know, we tend to forget that from Beijing's point of view, the United States and democratic thought still appear to be pretty darn formidable. 
Mm. Uh, and, you know, as I say, it's referred to in the document that we're really worried about these ideas about Western constitutionalism. Uh, it seems to make too much sense to a lot of people in China. Uh, so, you know, yes, China is very assertive, but um, I, I think it's really at, at its core, it's worried about peaceful evolution. Yeah, I, um, well, I hate to say it, but I'm going to agree with Joe. Oh, dear. Uh, again, <laughs> and, and with Tim. Uh, I've been. Here goes the cage fight. Yeah. There we go. Um, uh, but I've been impressed since the beginning of the Xi leadership uh, with the undertone of insecurity in the leadership. And in the 08, 09, uh, 2010 period, there were several real, really serious problems that confounded the leadership. Uh, and under whose leadership uh, and the collective leadership structure uh, that made these problems hard to address. It includes uh, the beginning of the economic downturn, partly because of falling off the demographic cliff. Uh, it included problems in uh, foreign policy coordination, especially in the East and South China Seas. Uh, it included um, problems of ethnic unrest in Tibet and in Xinjiang. Um, and so uh, out of that emerged, I thought, a really uh, significant uh, sense of insecurity in the leadership. And that therefore, at the 12th Congress, they empowered Xi Jinping to take a stronger role as general secretary, not to overturn the collective leadership, but take a more strong role in guiding it. And the uh, uh, 18th Congress uh, political report delivered by Hu Jintao presented the agenda of many of the things that Xi Jinping pursued, uh, including the corruption campaign, the party work style, party centralization, and so forth. So many of the policies that she's been pursuing are responsive to that, to that perceived series of crises. Uh, and I read that into the present resolution as well. Um, I think the triumphalism in much of the resolution uh, reflects, as Joe suggests, defensiveness in the face of very serious challenges, uh, added to which I think it characterized the present world situation as a period of turbulence and transformation, uncertainty, and how China was going to fit into it. So the combination of external problems but with the abiding problems internally I think underscores that this is a leadership that may feel confident in some respects, but they face real problems uh, and aren't uh, certain that their hold on power is, uh, is going to be lasting. And therefore, they're ready to take drastic steps to try to address that. Um, so again, I'm sorry to agree with both Tim and Joe, but there you go. <laughs> it's happened before. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> but maybe I can throw out something that you can, uh, that you can disagree with. So I'm, you know, the role of COVID, because I think we're, we've outlined the challenges that they're having and that the relationship between Xi Jinping and collective leadership is not so simple. But COVID you know, started with, of course, being the, 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 the so-called uh, China Cher Chernobyl moment in, in Wuhan, but it's come through with the massive mishandling in North America and Europe and just ongoing waves of it, you know, at, at least for the Chinese domestic, uh, audiences, it's like, oh my God, you know, it, it is, and I think that the destabilization of supply chains and international relations built around COVID will probably cement the ability of Xi Jinping to stay on the simple uh, political choice of in turbulent times, don't change horses. I want to, before turning to our audience for Q&A, I want to do a quick lightning round of, of something that I, I, I promised I'd get to with all of you, and that is um, to, um, to identify uh, one conventional wisdom or, uh, or settled truth that we encounter in the literature or, or you know, talking heads um, with regard to China that you feel needs to be re-examined, shaken up, uh, maybe shot down, and, and tell us why. Uh, so let's start with Alice. Um, well, I'll give you a twofer, and that is to say I am sick to death of comparisons of Xi Jinping to Mao Zedong yes. and to Chinese emperors. I think Mao and Xi Jinping are worlds apart in their orientations. Xi Jinping is exercising power through institutions. Mao Zedong made his power by destroying institutions. 
Uh, Xi Jinping uh, is working within the framework of socialism with Chinese characteristics as economic development is the key for Mao it was waging class struggle. These were leaders that are just worlds apart. They're nothing of light. And I wrote my dissertation on Manchu factional politics in the 1660s and 1670s. And I can guarantee you when you look at the nitty gritty of imperial era politics and emperors and uh, Xi Jinping don't look anything alike. So those are my pet feeds. Thank you. Those are great. Um, I've got to look up that dissertation. Joe, over <laughs> to you. <laughs> well, first of all, I, I would agree with uh, Alice that um, she and no, Mao are worlds apart. Uh, and Tim will, of course, agree that Xi Jinping really is executing Liu Xiaoqi policies. Uh, you know, that you go back and read the uh, Liu Xiaoqi's essay on being a good communist, and it's it's all there. Um, and so <laughs> Liu Xiaoqi was literally the anti-Mao. Um, but the, the, the thing that I think that we most misunderstand about China is what we were just talking about, uh, which is the idea that China uh, is triumphalist, that they have solved their major problems, that they're internationally assertive, and that this has been in train, well, you take your author either from day one or simply since 1989. Uh, and we miss uh, the insecurity. Uh, we miss the defensiveness. Uh, we miss everything that the United States has done, including uh, a certain bombing in Belgrade, which uh, seems to have been forgotten in Washington, but not in Beijing. Uh, so I think we need to start looking at problems from a Beijing perspective and not just from a Washington perspective. Thank you, Tim. Well, this is the problem of, you know, of a triumvirate, right? You know, I'm Lepidus down in Africa, like, oh, well, the, uh, <laughs> the, 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 uh, the, 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 the stole my thunder. I, which is, but I think there is, uh, it matters that three of such as us think, think Liu Xiaoqi. And what I would add to that is, um, lest you think we're saying how much nicer Xi Jinping is than Mao, because you know Liu Xiaoqi was such a terrific guy who went through organizations. I try to tell my students, think in terms of the difference between Mao and Liu as the difference between witch hunts and Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> Because, you know, when, when Mao had problems, he would fire up the people to go, you know, get pitchforks and go get whoever. Liu Xiaoqi, he, he just, uh, you know, he got the priesthood together and had, had a commission for inquisition, right? That's, and, and through work teams. And so it's work teams versus mass mobilization. The last thing I'd say, the, the shibboleth that worries me is that this, on so much of the uh, Western commentary that I see, the utter dismissal of ideas that 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 belief is not in this is all bullshit you know this is this is all just um code word for political interest and power politics it is of course that but part of chinese governance and um, and, and alice i'm hoping that you'll, you'll you'll back me up on this is ideological governance from the from the from the dynasties all the way through um political tutelage under sun yat sen to how uh, Chiang Kai-shek uh, wanted the Nationalist Party to run everything, is there's a belief in the leadership that they have a more scientific view and they need to have a pedagogical state. I still think that the party is, is attempting to run a pedagogical state, which is to train people to be modern citizens. What the content of that is, we now know that it should not include constitutions. I think we're all in probably agreement on those points. Okay, fabulous. Let's turn to the Q and A. Uh, I'm going to pull questions um, out of the Q and A box. Um, there was an earlier one which I don't see right now, but I want to get to, um, and it touches on something that Tim just mentioned. You know, uh, there's going to be a strong effort to propagate ideology and ideas uh, through the party and and outwards through society. But of course, we're not in the 1930s learning how to be a good communist anymore, uh, or the 40s. We're not even in 1981. China's a much more complex society, a much more cynical society. Uh, you know, how well is this going to work? How much eye rolling is going to occur as people have to sit down and, and you know, um, grind through these texts? 
uh, is is Xi Jinping using uh, old worn out tools? I think uh, propaganda has been marvelously modernized. Uh, not only do they have these rather ponderous documents that uh, only the people who are sent to party schools uh, will read, uh, but they have all sorts of mechanisms for reaching out to the so-called masses. Uh, and they, they take the forms of um, popular things like um, what, what, uh, positive energy, uh, say good things, uh, you know, be upbeat, um, all these sorts of things. Uh, they have cartoons that go out there. Uh, I think that one of the things that actually distinguishes the Xi Jinping era is that he actually cares that what everybody thinks. I think Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao yeah, right. cared what the 800 thought. Mm -hmm. uh, Xi Jinping cares what the masses think. And he really uh, is using, the propaganda department has gotten really sophisticated. Um, and uh, they're doing all sorts of stuff there to popularize these things. And they, you know, they'll pick up memes that start out as popular themes, give them a little twist and, and return them as you will to the masses. And the, it will come out as Xi Jinping is great or Zhongguo uh, Hanzan, you know, China's great. Uh, well, Joe, this is a Western success. Those people in the propaganda department were trained at Harvard and Stanford, and they're just really smart people. And, and, and remember, Xi Jinping cares about what people think, just like Zhu Yuanzhang, Ming Taizu, cared about what people thought. <laughs> Ellis, anything to add there? No, I agree with Joe. I think okay. I, it's impressive how the propaganda system has evolved in directions um, that that enable the party to present a enlist a positive image and so forth. I'm also impressed though with the other side of that and the uh, ability of the party increasingly to try to monitor social media and uh, inject itself into education in ways that it hadn't uh, for a while. Uh, these are, uh, uh, I think will invite a certain amount of resistance and resentment uh, and that's hard to measure, you know, but uh, I think there's a balance in there somewhere. Yeah, and the history tells us, and that there's demonstration, the work of the uh, historians and working on uh, PRC history, I'm thinking particularly of uh, 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 Jeremy Brown and Matthew Johnson on the um, uh, grassroots Maoism. They can document, even in high Maoism, how people resisted, used it for their own interest, ignored it. You know, the party is not all powerful when you get on the ground. That's right. 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 People still have agency. So yes. I want to end up, you know, we're, we've largely been talking about China's domestic politics, and I want to end up uh, with a question uh, that has strong domestic dimensions, but is global uh, and is on very much on the minds of many Americans. Um, what do you think about Xi Jinping's designs on Taiwan and the timetable um, based on what you've observed domestically and, and in these resolutions? Um, uh, go ahead, Alice. Um, well, in the resolution, uh, they basically underscored the standing uh, positions uh, that do not raise any immediate implication of an effort to unify by military force or otherwise. They do, they do strongly reassert the one country, two systems approach, um, which to me seems rather curious given the fate of Hong Kong. Uh, but um, uh, but they underscored the basic unification, peaceful unification approach, and don't give a hint of any sort of advanced efforts to upgrade a timetable. Um, um, so uh, I think much of the discussion in Washington D.C., which seems to be a world in itself these days, um, is engaged in an effort to try to gin up um, uh, impetus uh, to change the status quo across the Taiwan Strait. And uh, if I'm hearing Joe correctly, uh, this is coming from the American side, not from the Chinese side. Uh, and I think that's dangerous. Um, and so a degree of self-reflection and examination, I think, is warranted here to be careful about who's doing what and provoking whom. Well, Thank you. I Joe, do you want to pick up on that? Yeah. I, I hate to really agree with Alice again, but uh, <laughs> I'm this, sorry. This could be, be, but you know, when a member of Congress goes to Taiwan and declares that she is now in the Republic of Taiwan, that could, I mean, that's terribly provocative. Mm -hmm. uh, and 
who ends up getting hurt in that situation? It's the people of Taiwan. Uh, if there is ever a military conflict there, even if it's turned back, thousands of people on Taiwan will die. And members of Congress ought to be aware of that simple truth. For, the, for Beijing, the Taiwan issue is existential. They will fight over it, but they don't intend to fight over it now. Um, in fact, I don't think they intend to fight over it at all. I think they intend to use military force to keep the United States away and convince the people of Taiwan that they have no other choice but to come back to the motherland. Um, you know, I think that old Python strategy stays in place. Go ahead, I was Alan. just going to say, God, Joe, you and I have to find something to disagree about. <laughs> Are you still a 49ers fan? <laughs> oh, there you go. There you go. But I think a closing thing when it comes to international relations and our relationship with China, and I speak from Canada, uh, which relations are as bad or worse, uh, the, uh, is uh, the need for diplomacy, the need for, uh, you know, uh, you know, the old, we're showing ourselves to be old hippies, but, you know, remember the old saying, peace is like bread, you have to make it every morning. The default mode is not peace. The default <laughs> mode is war. And we could easily fall into it here for the particular reasons that we've discussed. And you know, it's a plea and a call for inspired diplomacy to keep the irresolvable, irrational, you know, unsatisfying relationship between Taiwan and PRC. It's still better than the alternative. Mm -hmm. Much better. Well, thank you all. This has been a, just a, a fascinating conversation. And I hope that we can bring you all out here physically soon. This will pass um, and we will, uh, we will get you here. Um, for those who are in the room, um, this is a really active time in our speaker series. We've got a couple more events scheduled this month. On December 7th, Professor Meg Rithmeyer of Harvard Business School will be presenting her research on mafia-like business systems in China, putting Xi Jinping's unfolding crackdown on business into context. Then on December 15th, uh, Jeffrey Stoff and I will unveil a major new Hoover report on the ethical risks of US research collaboration with China on artificial intelligence, especially the implications for mass surveillance and human rights. Uh, Sophie Richardson, China Director of Human Rights Watch will join us for that discussion. And we hope to see you at both events. Um, I wanna thank our guests today, our panelists. It's a conversation that uh, undoubtedly will be ongoing. I'll try to find more areas of disagreement next time, and I hope there will be a next time. Thank you again. Thank you, uh, Thank you very much. For that.